This is Richard Harlan Smith of The Movie Morlocks, the official film blog of Turner Classic Movies. Welcome to this exclusive audio commentary for The Earth Dies Screaming. We begin with stock footage. The budget for this film was about $100,000 on a three-week shooting schedule. Cheap and tight. The cutaway to the lifeless engineer is likely original, but the miniature work and the footage of the train derailing are all culled from pre-existing materials. The film also makes economic use of footage from Village of the Damned, as in this shot of a car crashing into a brick wall. We'll see more reused footage from Village of the Damned, but I point out that it's not footage from the movie as we know it. Rather, it strikes me as unused alternate camera footage. The angles are different, as in this bit where the plane plummets to Earth. The angle on the pilot is different, and the crash is framed higher and closer in than in Village of the Damned. We'll not see, as we did in Village, the flames from the wreckage, just the column of rising smoke. Both the Village of the Damned and the Earth Die Screaming were shot in part and likely edited at Shepperton Studios. In fact, this shot of the guy on the grass was filmed on the lawn of Littleton Manor House at Shepperton. If you've ever seen the picture of Sigourney Weaver testing a flamethrower during production of Alien, which was also filmed at Shepperton, that was on this lawn as well. Right. Main titles. Now. The Earth Dies Screaming. Not to be confused with Harold Daniels' My World Dies Screaming from 1958, which was re-released some years later as Terror in the Haunted House. This striking title track is the work of Elizabeth Lutyens, the first woman to score a feature film in the United Kingdom. Lutyens was one of Great Britain's premier avant-garde composers, but that not being what you would call a bull market, she turned to film work to pay her rent. She started off doing documentaries for the British government and then graduated to features in 1948 with Penny and the Pownall Case, a crime thriller that featured a 26-year-old Christopher Lee in an early lead role. Coincidentally, Lutchen's final feature film score was for Theater of Death in 1967, which also featured Christopher Lee. The Earth Dies Screaming was written by an American, Harry Spaulding, credited here as Henry Cross. Spaulding hated the title The Earth Dies Screaming, which was not his doing. Uh, but that's not why he used an alias. He was just writing a lot of scripts in those days and wanted to vary his byline. Spalding got his start as a story editor for independent producer Robert Lippert, who bankrolled this movie with his British partner, Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons, who one day hanged himself in his London office. Terence Fisher is a name we all know from his work for Hammer Film Productions, Curse of Frankenstein, Dracula, a.k.a. Horror of Dracula, The Mummy, and so many gothic shockers that followed. The Earth Dies Screaming was shot in and around the village of Shear in Guildford, Surrey, south by southwest of London. The sight of all these dead bodies reminds me that Lippert also bankrolled The Last Man on Earth, the first film adaptation of Richard Matheson's I Am Legend, a classic of post-apocalyptic fiction. The ground was littered with corpses in that movie, too. Meet our leading man, Willard Parker. Willard Parker was the American ringer for this British-made movie. He was cast in The Earth Dies Screaming for the same reason Howard Keel was cast in Day of the Triffids, Forrest Tucker in The Trollenberg Terror, and Dana Andrews in Crack in the World, as an enticement to American audiences. Co-productions all between the U.S. and the U.K., these movies were crafted to appeal to moviegoers on both sides of the Atlantic. Hammer Film Productions had, by this point, pretty much dispensed with American talent having done sufficiently well uh, with their gothic horrors. But prior to that, they too relied on the Yankee talents of uh, Robert Preston, Dane Clark, Zachary Scott, uh, Dean Jagger, and Brian Donlevy, who starred in the first two theatrical Quatermass films. But Lippert was still thinking transatlantic marquee value, so we have Willard Parker. Willard Parker had been Columbia Pictures' new hope after World War II as an heir to the legacy of Errol Flynn, and the studio cast him as the Zorro-esque hero of Henry Levin's 1946 swashbuckler, The Fighting Guardsman, as an aristocrat who rallies the peasantry against Napoleon. Another role from around the same time was as a heroic ship captain in the maritime costumer The Wreck of the Hesperus, but for whatever reason, Parker never really took as a leading man. 
He'd gotten his start as a contract player for Warner Brothers and paid his dues in smallish parts in such films as The Invisible Menace with Boris Karloff and A Slight Case of Murder starring Edward G. Robinson. You may recognize the bloke in the dinner jacket as Thorley Walters, a British stage and film actor whose resume goes back well before World War II. In fact, in 1933, he appeared in a production of Shakespeare's The Tempest at the Old Vic alongside Elsa Lanchester as Ariel, Charles Lawton as Prospero, and some punk wannabe actor named James Mason. More on Thorley Walters when he wakes up. Parker is walking towards the White Horse Inn, once a notorious meeting place for sheep poachers in Shear, later a public house, and still a public house. It still stands in Shear to this day and looks pretty much the same. Maybe a satellite dish or two on the roof. It strikes me as an odd touch that Parker's character, Jeff Nolan, doesn't so much as poke any one of the ostensibly dead people all around him, but he stops to pick up that dead bird and set it gently up off the ground. I suspect that the interior of the White Horse Inn here is a studio set. I've heard from those who've been to uh, the White Horse that the interior is remarkably similar to what we see here in the film, but this uh, set just looks too canned to me, so I suspect that we're on a Shepperton soundstage here. I could be wrong, but that's my gut. The Earth Dies Screaming was the first of three sci-fi programmers that Terrence Fisher made while on a break from his duties at Hammer. He followed this with Island of Terror, and then Island of the Burning Doomed, a.k.a. Island of the Burning Damned, a.k.a. Night of the Big Heat, which reunited him for the last time with actors Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, with whom he had first worked on Curse of Frankenstein a decade earlier. All three Terrence Fisher science fiction movies of the mid-60s are siege scenarios, with alien invaders or mutant monsters threatening some substrata of British society, and a lot of their action is confined to a public house of some kind. The always budget-conscious Bob Lippert favored single-location movies, movies that could be shot in and around a standing set or an available location. Lippert chased The Earth Dies Screaming with Night Train to Paris, an espionage thriller starring Leslie Nielsen and set on an overnight express train, Shades of The Lady Vanishes. Bob Lippert had a long-standing deal with Spiro Skoras, who ran 20th Century Fox for many years and would provide B-pictures to exhibit alongside more prestigious Fox product, which explains why The Earth Dies Screaming and Night Train to Paris and other Lippert product of this time were only about an hour long. They were literally B-movies. Turn it off. Dennis Price. Always trouble. Nothing gets easier when Dennis Price shows up. And here he has shown up in the company of Virginia Field, a.k.a. Mrs. Willard Parker. Each of these three came from a measure of affluence. Willard Parker was the son of either the Dutch consul to the United Nations or the vice consul. I've heard both. Perhaps it was vice consul, then consul, I don't know. Uh, his birth name was Worcester Van Epps. Raised in Forest Hills, he was a bit of a tennis phenom, and he actually came to California to teach tennis to Hollywood stars and then wound up being one of them. Dennis Price was born Deniston John Franklin Rose Price, and he was the son of a British brigadier general. It was expected that he would go into the military or law or the diplomatic service, but he did none of those things. He disgraced the bloodline and went instead into acting. John Gilgood gave Price his first big break, casting him in a 1937 staging of Shakespeare's Richard II on London's West End, alongside Michael Redgrave, Anthony Quayle, Peggy Ashcroft, and Alec Guinness. Guinness remained a good friend to Price over the decades that followed and did his level best to get Price work uh, when Price's luck was off, which, for Dennis Price, was more often than not. Virginia Field was born Margaret Cynthia Field in London, her father was a judge with connections to the royal family. A distant cousin on her mother's side to Confederate General Robert E. Lee, Field adopted Virginia as her stage name in honor of Lee's home state. So these three were all a bit posh, and yet here they were doing the Earth Dies Screaming for Lippert and for Peanuts. All three of these actors had been poised at one point or another 
for success, and yet all three, for one reason or another, missed that boat. After making a couple of movies in England, Virginia Field was brought to Hollywood by 20th Century Fox, but she made her first American film, Little Lord Fauntleroy, in 1936, on loan to David O. Selznick. Apparently, Selznick got a bit hands-on with her in his office, and her reaction was to grab a pitcher off of his desk and smash him over the head. Back at Fox, she played either the other woman in A Pictures, often starring Loretta Young, whom she despised, or she was the leading lady in B movies. She's in several of the Mr. Moto movies with Peter Lorre, but always playing different characters. Willard Parker was her third husband. Her first two husbands were the actor Paul Douglas and Ingrid Bergman's vocal coach, Howard Grode. She married Parker in 1951. All they've got to do is to move in and take over. And then it's every man for himself. Yes. A couple of years after this movie was shot here, uh, exteriors for the Boris Karloff film Die, Monster, Die were shot right here in Shear, which is a location as well for Peter Medak's The Ruling Class and a couple of the Bridget Jones movies. Thorley Walters is on his feet, and we're glad to have him. Walters, on four separate occasions, played John Watson to someone else's Sherlock Holmes, and he had, in fact, just co-starred with Christopher Lee in the West German-British co-production Sherlock Holmes and the Deadly Necklace, directed by Terence Fisher. His next performance after this was as the Renfield-esque madman Ludwig in Dracula, Prince of Darkness, again opposite Christopher Lee, again directed by Terence Fisher. Tell us some others there, too. Then it is just a local thing. I knew I was right. You better go. Come along. So we're in and in, and we're in for the night. Thank you, dear. The Earth Dies Screaming is like a number of horror movies in which the protagonists bunker against the onslaught of some external horror within the walls of some barely defendable structure. A bar, a pub, a town hall. We've seen this set up in Devil Girl from Mars and in Fisher's other mid-60s science fiction films, Island of Terror and Night of the Big Heat. There was a British ghost movie made during the Second World War, an Ealing film called The Halfway House, in which various travelers decamp at a rural inn to wait out a storm, each of them harboring some secret or other. Not a horror film, but Key Largo takes a somewhat similar setup in an entirely different direction. And in The Birds, there's temporary sanctuary in a diner. The prototype goes way back, at least as far as Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, where the Tabard Inn is the place where all the pilgrims meet and swap stories of what they've seen in the world. In Rio Bravo, the sanctuary is a jail. John Carpenter, of course, paid homage to Rio Bravo in Assault on Precinct 13th. Terence Fisher was a big John Ford fan. His favorite Ford film was Stagecoach, yet another tale of desperate characters finding common cause in dangerous territory. With the dead all lying about outside and the living barricaded indoors, desperate for news and getting on one another's nerves, it's hard not to think of George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, which was made only a few years after this. Romero has long credited Lippert's The Last Man on Earth as an influence on his movie, but I have to wonder if The Earth Dies Screaming is somehow in the mix as well. There are similarities here to Night of the Living Dead and also Dawn of the Dead, for that matter, but we'll talk about them as they manifest themselves. Don't worry, Don't worry. He's all right. Take your hands off me. In the role of Vi Vanda Godsill, who often played coarse, low-class women, landladies, and barmaids, and the odd tart making the moves on Stanley Baker in Hell is a City or Richard Harris in The Sporting Life. You may remember her from Horrors in the Black Museum and Conga with Michael Goff, or from a couple of the Pink Panther movies. At a distance, the invaders remind me of the biohazard suits that James Olsen and Arthur Hill wear in early scenes in Robert Wise's The Andromeda Strain, another movie that begins with a small town and dozens of the inexplicably dead. I love the fact that nobody could catch Vi in time as she dashed out of the inn in her gown and high heels. For me, the subtext is that nobody really cares what happens to Vi. The space suits. 
don't recognize them. The crap-ass spacesuits that Leopard has hung on those stuntmen tends to elicit uh, derisive snorts whenever the Earth dies screaming gets screened, but the provenance of those costumes is worth discussing. They look a bit like Doctor Who's Cybermen, but the Cybermen were not introduced on that show until 1966, two years after the Earth Die Screaming was in cinemas. Those dome-shaped helmets were leftovers from a couple of movies that were shot at Shepperton in previous years. The Road to Hong Kong, the last of the road pictures starring Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, and The Mouse on the Moon, the sequel to The Mouse That Roared. You would see that sort of quilted material, not on the Cybermen, but on the title creatures in the 1977 Doctor Who story arc, The Robots of Death. Of course, it may well have been very common, possibly fireproof material uh, that would have been in abundance at any studio where fire stunts were performed. Some more spidery incidental music, courtesy of Elizabeth Lutyens. So at about the 20 minute mark, we've established the dynamic of the Earth Dies Screaming. For a 60 minute movie, it does nonetheless adhere to the three act structure. And with Vi's death and the introduction of the robots, we segue now into act two. In some ways, the Earth Dies Screaming strikes me as more predictive of Night of the Living Dead and all the stuff spawned by Night of the Living Dead than was The Last Man on Earth. While The Last Man on Earth had The Walking Dead laying siege to a house, which is very Night of the Living Dead-like, uh, in The Earth Dies Screaming, the protagonists realize that they can evade the robots by being very quiet and moving with silent purpose while trying to maintain unity against the inevitability of descent from within, all of which strikes me as a more obvious template for Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead and The Walking Dead and Fear the Walking Dead and everything that comprises uh, the 21st century take on the zombie apocalypse than The Last Man on Earth. And how Night of the Living Dead is this shot of the car passing the cemetery? And who's in the car? A young man and woman. Not brother and sister in the car, but man and wife, a sort of pencil sketch for the characters of Tom and Judy, the doomed young lovers of Night of the Living Dead. That Vauxhall would also turn up as Leslie Nielsen's car in Night Train to Paris. So Harry Spaulding wrote this at home in America. Uh, I don't believe he went to England for the shooting, and as an American, I don't know if he intended the Earth Dies Screaming to reflect in any substantive way the divisions of class and age and race that were then ripping the seams of British society. Nevertheless, as a finished product, I find that the Earth Dies Screaming hints at having some ideas about those issues, buried though they may be under a metric ton of pulp sci-fi. Lippert movies were not made by agenda or to reflect a point of view about the world. They were made to bring in cash. They were product. If the question was, do you want it good or do you want it Wednesday, the Lippert answer was always, we want it Tuesday. But, nonetheless, British actors were hired and photographed by a British crew against British backgrounds with a British director in charge. And at the back of all that was a country working through issues of class and race. And those kinds of things do tend to to leach into the work, just as the societal concerns and anxieties of the United States in the Vietnam War era ferreted their way into the pulse of Night of the Living Dead. On top of being a siege scenario, the Earth Dies Screaming is also an invasion story, belonging to a category of narratives told in various media that extends certainly to H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds, published in 1898 and even beyond that. We're talking invasion literature. The War of the Worlds was not the first alien invasion scenario, but its impact and influence are so great that we don't really need to discuss the now obscure and forgotten works that floated similar ideas before it. Before invasion literature imagined attacks upon our planet, our countries, our towns and homes by extraterrestrial beings, there was a significant body of work devoted to invasions by foreign armies. With the sophistication of long-distance travel, mass travel in the second half of the 19th century, anxieties began to fester about borders being breached. The invention of the hot air balloon had Great Britain concerned that invaders would loft in from Germany or France, as did 
discussions about an underwater tunnel to be constructed between England and the European continent. Parliamentarians and punters alike feared that these innovations would leave the back door open to foreign occupation. The War of the Worlds was simply expanding upon a school of literature that had already existed, novels that speculated what life would be like if Germany invaded England, if France invaded England, if Great Britain invaded the United States, and so on. George Tompkins Chesney's The Battle of Dorking, published about 20 years before the War of the Worlds, projected a war fought between England and Germany on British soil, the subject also of Erskine Childers' The Riddle of the Sands. William Lacue's The Great War in England in 1897, that's the full title of the book, it was actually published in 1894, uh, made the invading force a coalition of France and Russia. These books were the grandfathers of movies like John Milius's Red Dawn and both Invasion USA movies, the Albert Zugsmith Cheapy from the Cold War and the Chuck Norris one from the Reagan era. But as the 19th century yielded to the 20th, the obvious next step for Invasion Lit was to imagine invaders from the stars, as did Wells. Uh, in a couple of years before the War of the Worlds by Robert Potter with the germ growers, which actually is more of a tale of alien infiltration, a la Jack Finney's The Body Snatchers and Robert Heinlein's The Puppet Masters than Invasion. Curiously, given that War of the Worlds was so distinctly British in its telling and was so influential, British cinema took its sweet time to run with that ball. Generally speaking, science fiction was not the long suit of the British film industry, and their output in that regard for the first half of the 20th century, anyway, was fitful. The films too often reflecting less the ideas of British writers than patterns and paradigms that had been profitable in America. So while America had The Day the Earth Stood Still and The Thing from Another World and everything else, from the ridiculous to the sublime, including an Americanized adaptation of The War of the Worlds, Great Britain coughed up Devil Girl from Mars, uh, and a clutch of sci-fi melodramas that focused on the possession of a woman, uh, the perfect woman, stolen face, and four-sided triangle, the latter two directed by Terence Fisher for Hammer. It was on British TV that the real ideas flourished, almost exclusively due to the genius of Nigel Neal, a BBC staffer who cooked up the miniseries The Quatermass Experiment and Quatermass 2 and Quatermass and the Pit, thoughtful, well-argued and executed dramas about alien infiltration, invasion, and influence on British society. Hammer would make feature films from these TV serials, though the third, and arguably the best, Quatermass in the Pit, was not realized until 1967. But the influence of Neil was a game-changer, and you began to see more science fiction, and good stuff too, through the 1960s, though on the subject of alien invasion, the movies tended to be, as is The Earth Dies Screaming, pure unalloyed pulp, kitty matinee material, the terror knots, they came from beyond space, and a personal favorite, Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD, one of two Doctor Who crossover feature films starring Peter Cushing in the title role, and also filmed at Shepparton. During this time too, Britain gave us a film version of one of those invading foreign army scenarios of which the Victorians were so obsessed. Battle Beneath the Earth, in which the Red Chinese burrow under the free world with a mind to popping up like prairie dogs and taking over. But in that mini-glut of alien invasion movies sits The Earth Dies Screaming, which suggests possible influences. Harry Spalding never said as much, I don't think, but this film seems to owe a small debt to John Wyndham's The Day of the Triffids, the film adaptation of which was released six months or so before this movie and The Trollenberg Terror, another TV serial adapted as a feature. In Day of the Triffids, an alien, not an invasion per se, but rather an alien seeding of the planet Earth, is challenged by protagonists who, for whatever reason, missed out on seeing the meteor shower that camouflaged the alien contamination of Earth and an ensuing plague of blindness that has left 99% of mankind sightless and helpless. In The Earth Dies Screaming, the protagonist's pool is made up of people who somehow manage to avoid the gas attack that has killed off all but 1% of the world's population. In The Trollenberg Terror, the creature in question reanimates the bodies of its victims to serve at a plot point we had seen previously in both Ed Kahn's Invisible Invaders and Ed Wood's Plan 9 from Outer Space. That gambit gets a bit of play here in The Earth Dies Screaming, as we will witness shortly. So as his wife, Virginia Field, was the perennial other woman in pictures, so Willard Parker tended to be the second male lead, appearing in support of such stars as James Stewart, 
Glenn Ford, Robert Ryan, Howard Duff, Robert Young, Howard Keel, to name but a few. Columbia continued to throw him the occasional lead. He did a wrestling picture called Body Hold, uh, and he began working after 1950 or so for Lippert as Barbara Britton's leading man in Bandit Queen and playing the title role in The Great Jesse James Raid. And he began doing television when Joel McRae opted not to recreate for TV the role he had created on radio as lawman Jace Pearson on NBC's Tales of the Texas Rangers. Parker got the part and headlined that show, which ran on CBS from 1955 to 1958. Tales of the Texas Rangers was sort of a dragnet on horseback, although it was contemporary. It was modern day. His sidekick in that, his Harry Morgan, was Harry Lauder, whom you may remember as the army general who greets Cornelius and Zira on the beach at the beginning of Escape from the Planet of the Apes. As a quick sidebar to that show, its technical advisor was real-life Texas Ranger M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez, who had a few years earlier investigated the phantom killer slayings in Texarkana, Texas, the guy that Ben Johnson played in The Town That Dreaded Sundown. What's the matter with Otis? Oh, he gets pain scared, trying to drink himself to death. Can't really blame him. I can, as long as there's a chance. Maybe he thinks there isn't. Haven't you ever felt that way? No, and I don't think I ever will. I'm remiss in identifying Anna Polk. You may remember her from her genre performances in The Frozen Dead and Tower of Evil. She had made her feature film debut for Michael Winner in 1962 in Play It Cool, a youth picture with music by guest artists Billy Fury, Bobby V, and Danny Williams, the British Johnny Mathis. Polk plays a rebellious young heiress afoot in the nightclubs of London, and her disapproving father in that is played by Dennis Price, who of course was with her as well in Tower of Evil. At the time that they made this movie, Willard Parker and Virginia Field were based in the Palm Springs, Palm Desert area, and they were owners of a motel called The Parkers. Field later operated a boutique, and Parker dabbled in real estate. Her last acting assignment was in the very last episode of Adam 12, and she has exactly the same hairdo. Anna Polk's on-screen husband is David Spencer, not his real name. He was born David de Saram in Ceylon, better known these days as Sri Lanka. He and his brother Jeremy were both child actors who branched out from roles on the radio to parts in films. In Kind Hearts and Coronets, Jeremy had played the Dennis Price character as a young boy, and he's also in Fahrenheit 451. He plays that guy at the very beginning of the movie who gets the call to run before the firemen show up to burn his books. Anna Polk also plays a small role in Fahrenheit 451. As a youth, David Spencer had provided the voice of the perennial British schoolboy on the radio series Just William, but because he was somewhat dark-complected, he often played ethnic roles in films and on TV, Spaniards, Italians, Indians. He's in Hammer, Stranglers of Bombay, and Asians. In fact, he plays a Chinese military man in Battle Beneath the Earth. He also played a Tibetan on the Doctor Who storyline, The Abominable Snowman, opposite the second Doctor, Patrick Troughton. Given his stock in trade playing non-whites, I have to wonder if David Spencer's casting in this was meant in some way to complicate the discussion that seems to be going on subtextually about the New England. Uh, it's played off here as a class issue with his character, Mel, uh, being sensitive about money. In fact, that's what this whole scene is about, the devaluation of money in a world gone mad. But the want of money has made Mel the man that he is, and yet it's easy to imagine the problems of Mel and Anna Polk's character, Lorna, uh, as young marrieds, being at least partially racially based. Thorley Walters was a personal friend of Terence Fisher. They made quite a few movies together, although I think at this point they had just done uh, Hammer's The Phantom of the Opera and Sherlock Holmes and The Deadly Necklace. Fisher was at this point on hiatus, Hammer-wise, Bray, the little studio at which Hammer produced their films, was shut down uh, in early 1964 for renovations after completion of Fisher's The Gorgon the year before, another team up with Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. New construction at Bray lasted well into the following year, at which point Fisher returned to direct Dracula, Prince of Darkness, the second sequel to Horror of Dracula, or simply Dracula as it's known in the UK. Oddly though, Hammer continued to make films in the time that Bray was shuttered, most of them at Elstree, Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, The Brigand of Kandahar, She, The Nanny. Fisher directed none of them. In fact, after wrapping The Earth Dies Screaming in early 1964, he didn't direct another movie until Dracula, Prince of Darkness, went on the floor at the reopened Bray in May of 1965. So why did no one hire him for over a year? 
There has been talk, loose talk, of a hammer punishment levied against Fisher for the failure of The Phantom of the Opera, a film for which the studio had great but unrealized hope. But that's tough to substantiate. Obviously, they had him come back to direct The Gorgon, made well after The Phantom Tanked, and then Dracula, Prince of Darkness. But from Curse of Frankenstein in 1957 to The Gorgon in 1964, Fisher directed, I think, 13 movies for Hammer of all genres, horror movies, swashbucklers, mysteries. But after that, they only had him back, with the exception of The Devil Rides Out, to make Dracula and Frankenstein sequels. So, for as much as I'm skeptical about Fisher actually being punished by Hammer, I can sort of see why some people are inclined to think that he might have been. Our robot men are back, or robot, as Willard Parker says. So I mentioned earlier that the parking meter-looking headpieces for the robots were kicking around Shepard and Studios for several years and popped up in a couple of movies prior to the Earth Die Screaming. But that microphone up in front is new to the mix. I can't say it's the exact same microphone, uh, but you can see one identical to it in Village of the Damned, the one with which Michael Gwynn's character communicates with the airplane that crashes early in the film. Those robot suits are kind of a deal breaker for a lot of people with this movie, but my feeling is that Fisher shoots them well. Uh, he has structured this fairly inessential bit of business very well. It's very moody and eerie. Uh, and Elizabeth Lutchen's minimalist scoring also adds value. It's nicely underplayed, and I think that goes a long way towards boosting the mood of unease and danger. Shooting the picture for Fisher was a gentleman named Arthur Lavis, who is little remembered today, but who did nice work in black and white. He photographed a few films for Lippert, The Horror of It All, a comedy directed by Fisher and starring Dennis Price and Pat Boone, Night Train to Paris, and Witchcraft, and starring Lon Chaney Jr., Lavis's work in color was never quite as evocative, and he ended his career as a DP on several films for Alan Birkinshaw, including the 1989 adaptation of Ten Little Indians set in South Africa. Oh, Dennis Price is up to no good, as usual. He's just been waiting for everyone else to fall asleep. He often played disreputable, unreliable, shady, sleazy, felonious, murderous, and occasionally totally evil characters. In the Ealing classic Kind Hearts and Coronets from 1949, which is another British film absolutely obsessed with issues of class, he plays the vengeful heir to an aristocratic family that shunned his mother for marrying an Italian opera singer. So he exacts a revenge upon that family, killing seven or eight of its members, all played by Alec Guinness. And speaking of dead people, Vanda Godsell has risen from the grave, or the bed, as the case may be. Again, another beautifully evocative setup courtesy of Fisher and Lavis. Horror fans tend to remember Dennis Price's last and often least performances, his cameos in Twins of Evil, Tower of Evil, Horror Frankenstein, Horror Hospital, and forget, or perhaps they never knew, that he was once one of Great Britain's top ten film stars. As stated, aliens using the resurrected corpses of humans to do their scut work wasn't a novelty in 1964. Uh, Invisible Invaders, Plan 9 from Outer Space, and the Trollenberg Terror had all folded into their narratives that particular plot wrinkle. The resurrected Vanda Godsell with her blank white eyes points ahead a decade or so towards Eugenio Martin's Horror Express, where the dead are raised yet again at the behest of an extraterrestrial influence, their movements robotic, zombie-like, and their eyes boiled white in their heads. And Godsell here is kind of a dead ringer, you should forgive the pun, for Alice Reinhardt, who played Peter Cushing's ill-fated assistant in Horror Express. It's kind of a shame that they re-kill old Vi, as she was pretty creepy in her evening dress and shawl. Vanda Godsell was a seasoned stage actress as well and performed in several plays by Tennessee Williams, including A Streetcar Named Desire, in which she was Blanche Dubois, she passed away for real in 1990 after a more than 50-year career. I, I don't understand. She came at me. I shot her. They all saw it. Dennis Price had a great voice. His words really cut through the air. Just about everyone who ever worked with him said that, uh, in sharp contrast to the characters he tended to play, Dennis Price was really the sweetest man. After Kind Hearts and Coronets, he had another big shot at stardom in a 1949 biopic of Lord Byron produced by Sidney Box, The Bad Lord Byron, which was a huge flop in its day 
and weakened his stock within the British film industry. But he continued to work exhaustively in films and on stage and in television as well. Dennis Price had two big problems. He was gay at a time when that could get you sent to prison, and he gambled and found himself in debt and in Dutch with the Inland Revenue, at which point he began to drink heavily. He also had an early marriage to actress Joan Schofield. I don't think it was just a paper marriage. It did produce two daughters, and Price is also said to have had an on-again, off-again affair with another actress, Margaret Layton, with whom he co-starred in Hungry Hill and uh, The White Unicorn and The Wonderful A Place of One's Own. So I guess, technically speaking, he was bisexual. Anyway, his marriage ended in 1950, and a couple of years later, he tried to kill himself. Failing that, he seemed, to those who knew him, to find renewed purpose in his work, and he went on to do many fine films, working alongside contemporaries like Peter Sellers, Terry Thomas, Ian Carmichael, Richard Attenborough, John Mills, and his good friend Alec Guinness. When Dirk Bogard was a young wannabe actor, he had an interview with an executive at the Rank Organization who told him that he, Bogard, didn't have looks good enough for films. And to illustrate his specific failings uh, in that regard, the executive showed Bogard headshots of three Rank actors who did fit the bill. Stuart Granger, James Mason, and Dennis Price. Cut to 1961, and Bogard found himself acting alongside Price in Basil Dearden's Victim, a controversial drama about the plight of closeted homosexual men living in Great Britain in which both Bogart and Price played closeted homosexuals. The decision by Price and Bogart, uh, for that matter, in 1961, half a decade still before the decriminalization of homosexual acts between consenting adults in the United Kingdom, uh, must have seemed like a career killer, but a victim killed nobody's career so far as I know. Price continued to be plagued by financial troubles, which is why, in addition to more prestigious films like Private's Progress, I'm All Right, Jack, Victim, uh, and the VIPs with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, he did stuff like The Horror of It All, Curse of the Voodoo, the 1965 film version of Ten Little Indians, and The Earth Dies Screaming. After he finished his work on this movie, he had a bit of luck and even success as one of the stars of The World of Worcester, a BBC TV series based on the writings of P.G. Woodhouse, who actually wrote three out of the 20 episodes over the course of three seasons. Woodhouse was particularly happy with Price's portrayal of the quintessential man's man Jeeves, the worldly valet to the aristocratic Bertie Wooster, played by Price's old friend Ian Carmichael. So Price's character, Quinn Taggart, what a great name, has gone rogue and revealed himself at last, though his unreliability was never really that big of a secret, was it? The Earth Dies Screaming offers us three representations of British men. We have Taggart, venal, selfish, manipulative, acquisitive, possessive, and imperialist. We have Thorley Walter's character, Edgar Otis, genial, good-natured, pure at heart, but passive and mostly useless, kind of a dickless wonder. And we have David Spencer's Mel, what we would have called back in those days an angry young man. That's this movie's view of British society. The women are negligible. The men are problematic, complicating the salvation of humanity by dint of their greed, their inability to act, or their anger. In the Gospel According to Harry Spaulding, it takes an American to set them right, which was par for the course in British science fiction movies at that time for reasons we've already discussed. The need on the part of the producers to stick a marquee-worthy American star in the lead role, Brian Donlevy in the Quatermass films, Dean Jagger in X the Unknown, Forrest Tucker in The Strange World of Planet X, Though it's worth noting that Tucker's ugly American was the problem, not the solution, in The Abominable Snowman, in which it was up to Peter Cushing's scrupulous Brit to set things right. But very often in these movies, the problem solver was a Yank, an outsider. Sometimes these movies were set elsewhere, Canada in Fiend Without a Face, some fictitious Middle European country in The Gamma People, Switzerland in The Trollenberg Terror. But the supporting cast was always British and the heroes invariably American. So it was primarily a, a commercial concession, but the subtext implied that there was something intrinsic to the British character that set him up to fail, leaving a hole for the American ringer to pop through and save the day. Clearly, Dennis Price has never pumped gas a day in his life. 
A lot of the Earth Dies screaming reminds me also of Survivors, the 1975 to 1977 British TV series created by Terry Nation, the man who gave us Doctor Who. Survivors was shot in the provinces as well, with lots of motoring about from village to village, the heroes encountering adversity and betrayal as they attempt to exist from day to day after a plague has wiped out nine-tenths of the world's population. And speaking of Doctor Who, I'm also reminded again of Dalek's Invasion Earth 2150 AD, which was made a couple of years after this. There's a character in that, played by the actor Philip Maddock, who is a bit like Dennis Price in this. In Dalek's Invasion Earth, Maddock is an opportunist, a human who betrays his fellow man to the Daleks for profit, like those bastards in World War II who sold out their countrymen to the Reich. Now, there are differences. Maddox's character, Broccoli, what a great name for a villain, right? Uh, he's a sneering, hiss and boo sort of baddie. He occupies a very small part of that film. He has probably less than five minutes of screen time. He's meant as nothing more than a second act complication, and then they do him in. He's betrayed by the Daleks as karmic payback for his sins. Price's character, Taggart, is more complex. Broccoli knows he's a villain, a rotter, and he doesn't care. He's Machiavellian. Taggart just thinks he's better than everybody else, superior. He wants to do it his way. He doesn't want to go north. He wants to go south. He wants to do what he wants to do. And that would be fine, but for some reason, he wants to take Virginia Field's character, Peggy, with him. His need to possess her doesn't strike me as sexual, which may have a lot to do with the fact that Dennis Price doesn't really telegraph a sexual vibe. If anything, he comes off as a bit repressed, the way he never loosens his necktie and waves that webbly around like it's a second dick. He even uses it to cold cock Jeff Nolan, his rival, after a fashion for Peggy. It's more like he's trying to uphold some version of the British way of life. I'm a man and you are my de facto wife and we will continue on in an orthodox manner as I see fit. Though we see now that he's quite content to leave Peggy to her fate as the alien presence begins to encroach slowly, inexorably, upon their erstwhile safe haven. This is the last we'll see of the living Dennis Price, in this movie, I mean. He was the first of the cast to die, as he did in 1973 at the age of only 58. His final films are often cited as evidence of his sad decline, but they are damned entertaining, nearly each and every one of them. I mentioned earlier that Anna Polk pops up in Francois Truffaut's Fahrenheit 451. She plays one of Julie Christie's vapid girlfriends in that scene where Oscar Werner begins reading aloud from David Copperfield and all the women shoot furtive glances at one another and then she jumps up at the end and says, Novels are sick! Another movie or series of movies that echo bits and bobs of The Earth Dies Screaming are the Blind Dead movies from Spain directed by Amanda de Osorio and produced between 1970 and 1974. In those films, if you're not familiar, the resurrected, somewhat zombie-like, but far from brain-dead medieval Satanists, the Knights Templar, gallop about on their skeletal horses and go after humans to drink their blood. There is, in those movies, as here, that uncomfortable shared company of sundry protagonists and antagonists who very often have to shelter in against the attack of the blind dead and very often find themselves at odds with one another. There are, as we have seen here, clashes and conflicts and betrayals among those characters on the way to the big and invariably downbeat finish. The blind dead are, by virtue of their specific handicap and having been dead for hundreds of years, slow in their advance, as are the spacemen of The Earth Dies Screaming, and considerable suspense is wrought by characters trying to slip about as quietly as possible, another potential legacy of Hitchcock's The Birds. In the first Blind Dead movie, released in 1971, a victim of the Knights Templar rises from the dead to menace the female lead. It's an odd, one-off set piece in that first movie, and D'Osorio never again attempts that gag over the course of the ensuing three sequels. They never really play that card in Night of the Living Dead, but in Dawn of the Dead, the characters do spend a little time in the acquisition of the shopping mall setting, creeping about, trying to make as little noise as possible, given the circumstances, so as not to draw the attention of the zombies, and that's a recurring motif as well on the Walking Dead TV series. There is a scene in another Harry Spaulding scripted movie from around this time, House of the Damned, shot in Los Angeles, an old dark house sort of thing, uh, where the protagonists have to spend the night or two nights in a house with a bad history. And the director of that movie, Maury Dexter, shoots through a screen or grill, as he does here, 
albeit in that movie with the hero on the outside and we don't quite know what's on the inside. Some lovely Mysterioso from Elizabeth Lutyens on the soundtrack. Aesthetically, Lutyens was a minimalist, and in that aesthetic, she had a confederate in Philip Martell, whose name you may remember from many a Hammer film. Philip Martell was a longtime conductor and musical director for Hammer. Uh, he replaced John Hollingsworth, Hammer's first musical director in 1955, and then held that position with Hammer for 30 or 35 years. Lutyens and Martell first worked together on Hammer's Never Take Sweets from a Stranger, Martell also arranged music and even wrote it. That song that the students sing at the tavern in Dracula Has Risen from the Grave was written by Martell, who took no credit. Uh, his contribution to British genre filmmaking is almost incalculable, but he also worked on more arguably legitimate stuff, such as Preminger's St. Joan and To Sir With Love. I don't know the names of either of the actors playing the resurrected townsfolk, but all I can say to both of them, albeit most likely posthumously, is well done. They are manifestly creepy, and half of it is the fact that they're shambling around in broad daylight. Willard Parker to the rescue. He's about to take out one of the spacemen, and we'll see that uh, Terrence Fisher has subbed out the stuntman in the tinfoil frock for an obvious dummy. Yeah, that's not terribly persuasive, is it? But I can't help but think of the guy in Dawn of the Dead who gets his head blown off in the scene in the tenement early in the film. If you still frame that sequence, and I, I know you have, uh, the dummy they use there is just as unconvincing. But you know what? We love it. We can't say that we don't love these movies, warts and all. He's gone. Now, I realize I'm reaching for it here, but whenever I see these robots, I imagine that the aliens who are attempting to conquer the Earth have had to construct their robots out of available materials on Earth, uh, in Great Britain in this case. And with England still rebuilding less than 20 years after the end of World War II, uh, the aliens have been forced to work with only that they could scrounge, so their robot slaves are made of scrap cast off radio and refrigerator and auto parts it's kind of neat an idea that the engine of our destruction as a race would be cobbled together from our collective junk heap from the trash of course another partial explanation for the sorry looking robots is that terence fisher he didn't give two shits about science fiction he just didn't that was a matter of the public record fisher wasn't interested in sci-fi which he certainly by this point bemoaned had degraded into alien invasion movies. He wasn't interested in that. He was interested in people. It's worth noting, I guess, that Fisher was raised a Christian scientist, so it was kind of inbred in him to reject science and technology on a certain level. He wasn't a Luddite, of course. He did convert to the Church of England at some point, uh, and given how often he seemed to be struck by cars while out walking, I don't think he ever avoided seeing a doctor. But his preference in art was the power of people, of personality in conflict and in extremis. And there comes a point in this movie where you can almost, almost sense that he's given up. I mean, it's around this point where the human conflict has kind of gone out of the thing. Mel has stopped being a punk. Taggart has gone AWOL. Lorna is having the baby, and everybody who is left is on the same page. So the onus of the drama is exterior from without, and it falls on the robots. And I don't think Fisher really cared about the robots. Think of Fisher's best movies and the central arguments in them. Peter Cushing versus Michael Goff in Horror of Dracula. Cushing versus Robert Urquhart in Curse of Frankenstein. Cushing versus Christopher Lee in The Gorgon, and so on. On top of being entertainment, escapism, what Fisher himself called the poetics of fantasy, these movies were moral arguments being worked out on screen. Serious, sober, and well-considered about procedure, about process, about belief and how to live, how to see the world and how to treat one another. And we get that here to a point, Parker versus Price, until Price abandons the group, and then it just becomes about resolving the problem and ending the thing. Although we do here throw in the plot complication, slight though it may be, of the birth of a child, of the first child 
born to a world that is 99% dead. You can't really see it yet, but among the things that they've brought for the baby is a gollywog, a type of doll that was very popular in the United Kingdom back then. You might at first glance mistake it for a little black Sambo doll, but it's not specifically that. The gollywog is a kind of endearingly, I mean, ostensibly endearingly creepy African rag doll that was the subject of a book published in 1895 and then quickly became a favorite toy of generations of Britons in the first half of the 20th century. You can still find gollywogs for sale in shops here and there in the UK, but they tend now to be a bit controversial, as you might well imagine. David Spencer once played Romeo to Julie Dench's Juliet, but in films and on TV, he saw that his parts were getting worse, not better, so he gave up acting in the early 70s and went into production, and he was for many years a director and producer for BBC Radio. He founded his own production company in the late 80s called Saffron and produced a number of TV specials about various Britons in the arts, from novelist Angus Wilson to the comedian Benny Hill. David Spencer was the last cast member of the Earth Dies Screaming to Die, as he did at the ripe old age of 78 in 2013. Sadly, his on-screen wife, Anna Polk, did not enjoy nearly so long a life. She succumbed to cancer in 1990 at the age of only 48. As for the Parkers, Willard made a couple of more movies after this, albeit never again as the leading man. He was a bad guy in Waco, a backlot western from Paramount, in which he's fatally bested by hero Howard Keel, and he also played a small role in Andrew Stone's 1972 biopic of Johann Sebastian Bach, The Great Waltz, starring Horst Buchholz. As I said earlier, the Parkers relocated to Palm Springs, Palm Desert, and ran a hotel named for them. They bought property and built homes, and some of those mid-century homes are rentable to this day, and the Parkers are actually name-checked in the ad copy, better remembered in their place of retirement than they are now in Hollywood, where they made their fleeting fame. Virginia Field died of cancer in 1992, and Willard Parker followed her to the grave four years later. Actually, most of the cast of The Earth Dies Screaming passed away within the space of just a couple of years. Vanda Godsell died in April 1990, Anna Polk in July of that same year. Thorley Walters died in 1991 at the age of 78. Virginia Field died just four months later in January 1992, and then Willard Parker in December 1996. So within six years, that's the whole cast right there, gone. The technical crew went first. Jack Parsons, as I said, committed suicide in 1971. Robert Lippard died in 1976. Dennis Fisher passed away in 1980. And composer Elizabeth Lutyens died in 1983. Screenwriter Harry Spaulding, whose resume also includes the ultra-cheap but very interesting The Day Mars Invaded Earth, as well as Witchcraft, Curse of the Fly, and the Bats in the Bunker post-apocalyptic drama Chosen Survivors nearly buried them all, dying as he did in 2008. Only David Spencer got to kick dirt on his grave. Right, the, uh, is correct. And how do we find the transmitter? With this and a piece of copper wire. I love Willard well, Parker's you know, radio in this. It's a zenith transoceanic model with shortwave. One of my abiding cinematic fetishes is crushing on people's transistor radios in old movies. That's one of the reasons I love these old movies so much is the gear. However quaint and antiquated it may look to modernize, the gear in these movies impressed me when I was a kid. I wanted to grow up specifically so that I could have my own portable shortwave radio and guns and save the world. The Earth Dies Screaming was made and released in 1964. It was a product of the Cold War, the Atomic Age. The specter of atomic fallout had been haunting the silver screen for nearly 20 years by this point in the form of the Ozymandian mutants of such films as Them, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, Tarantula, and Godzilla, King of the Monsters, and then more subtly in on the Beach, The World of Flesh and the Devil, Hammers the Damned, Panic in Year Zero, and Arch Obler's Five, which also folded pregnancy into the narrative only to dash the hopes of remnant humanity by having the baby stillborn. The Earth Dies Screaming is far less self-lacerating. It's not an atomic scare film, and yet it is a child, as are most of us, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was produced post-Berlin and Cuban Missile Crises, both international incidents in which the world held its collective breath waiting for somebody in power to push that button. Duck and cover time. Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, premiered in January 1964, just as The Earth Dies Screaming was getting going. The Earth Dies Screaming premiered in the fall of 1964 in October, as did Sidney Lumet's Failsafe. The following year would bring Peter Watkins' The War Game, a speculative documentary 
about the effects of thermonuclear war on British soil that was too disturbing for the BBC to air. In that respect, the Earth Die Screaming was a bit of a non sequitur, a bit of a throwback to the days of invasion literature. In the movie's eyes, we haven't, as a race, done anything wrong. We're victims. We're under attack. The movie doesn't rub our noses in our hubris or our greed. If anything, it's a very cursory reaffirmation of the Dunkirk spirit with everybody pitching in, each to his own strength and ability. The movie's final act is even a bit like an old World War II movie with Jeff and Mel searching for that thing they need to blow up in order to thwart the enemy and save the day, like the guns of Navarone or the bridge on the River Kwai or Objective Burma, in which Errol Flynn and his men drop into occupied territory to blow up a radio tower. It's worth noting that John Carpenter's They Live also ends with the destruction by the protagonists of a radio tower or antenna with which the alien invaders have infiltrated our race and camouflaged their presence. Do you suppose John Carpenter ever saw the Earth die screaming? The undead Dennis Price leading the robots to his former confederates in the drill hall reminds me very much of that scene in Dawn of the Dead, the original Dawn of the Dead, the good one, where uh, the late flyboy, his undead brain functioning solely on trace memories, leads the flesh-eating horde to the concealed safe haven in the shopping mall where the protagonists have been sitting out the zombie apocalypse. Peggy's a nice lady and everything, but she's kind of shit at survival, isn't she? I mean, she might have bought herself another minute by actually closing that door behind her. Monday morning quarterbacking, I guess. As Mel and Jeff are preparing to blow up the transmitter, I'm reminded of another bit in Dawn of the Dead where the characters in that movie land at the rural airstrip to refuel their helicopter, and in so doing, attract the attention of the local undead who begin shuffling their hungry way towards the chopper. It's that sort of bland country setting and the fact that both scenes play out in the midday sun that forge, at least for me, that similarity. And with Mel, like Roger in Dawn of the Dead, completely oblivious to the danger creeping up inexorably toward him. With the innovation of fast zombies in 28 Days Later and 28 Weeks Later and the 2004 Dawn of the Dead remake, we lost the, the possibility for this kind of incremental suspense set piece where the protagonists start off thinking, I can do this before they get me, only to realize all too late that they can't, or at least that's the, the question. I don't know if anyone has ever addressed a potential shared bloodline between the Earth Die Screaming and the Daleks of Doctor Who. The Daleks were introduced on British TV in December 1963, just before the Earth Die Screaming went into production. The Daleks returned to Doctor Who in uh, late 1964 for their second story arc, an invasion of Earth scenario that was later adapted as the feature film Daleks Invasion Earth 2150. In both versions of that story, the Daleks repurpose or co-opt human beings, not dead, just completely brainwashed as a shockwave of jackbooted stormtroopers who do their evil bidding. The robots here are kind of like the Daleks and their Robomen rolled into one. Now, whether or not there was any active influence or crossover is immaterial, really, because ultimately, genre-wise, they do share a kinship. They, they occupy spaces not far from one another on the same science fiction continuum. Is it just wishful thinking, or did he just shoot Dennis Price in the balls? And that was Thorley Walter's death wish moment. Well bold, sir. Well bold. I love that the movie gives Thorley Walters a heroic finish, an almost entirely useless character who, by all rights, in any other genre picture, should have been a victim. Edgar Otis is permitted to deliver the coup de grace. I don't the Earth Dies Screaming was Terrence Fisher's final film in black and white. He made only seven more features before his death in 1980. It's interesting that we see four robots lying prone outside the drill hall because we never saw that many activated in one place. But they probably lacked the helmets. I think Shepperton had just the two helmets, the ones that Hope and Crosby wore in Road to Hong Kong and then that David Kossoff and Bernard Cribbins wore in Mouse on the Moon. A very important young lady. All of a sudden, people mean something again. I love that line. All of a sudden, people mean something again. I think that line must have been very meaningful to Terrence Fisher. Well, I'm done here. Thanks for listening, and thanks also to a number of people who were very helpful to me in making this audio commentary happen. Richard Clemenson of Little Shop of Horrors magazine, Steve Prideau of the Say Hello Spaceman blog, producer-director Robert Chandler, and the inimitable Tom Warren. This is Richard Harlan Smith of The Movie Morlocks, signing off. 
keep watching the skies.